There's been a tradition in the, the Christian church ever since about the, the third or, or fourth century that whenever people heard the word Christ is risen, they would respond with gusto. Christ has risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ has risen indeed. Who's supposed to join you? Let's go. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. But on that first Easter morning, I don't believe that the women going to the tomb responded with much gusto. When they heard the words, Christ is risen, I think they responded differently. They may have responded, He is risen? Yes, He's risen, I think. Now, they were struggling. They didn't fully understand what it meant that Christ had risen from the grave. You know, on that first Easter morning, on the first day of the, the week, it, it was Sunday. The women went to the tomb early in the morning when they first had a chance. Now remember, Jesus had been crucified on Friday. And, and Friday would, at sundown, would have been the beginning of the Sabbath day. And Sabbath would have gone from sundown on, on Friday until sundown on Saturday. And so as faithful Jews, they knew that they could not do any work. They could not prepare Jesus' body on the, the Sabbath day. So, so they rested on the Sabbath. But now it's the first day of the week. It, it's Sunday. And they go at their first chance to, to, to go to the tomb in, in order to, to prepare Jesus' body. You know, it says it was very early in the morning and the women took spices to the tomb to put on Jesus' body. They were not going with expectancy that, that he was going to be risen. They were not going with expectancy that the tomb was going to be empty. They were going to the tomb with the expectancy of doing what you do when you grieve. They were doing what, what they knew they were supposed to do is to, to take spices and, and put on the body of, of the deceased. Now, the women were, were overcome by grief, and, and they weren't even thinking about uh, what they were going to encounter when they got there. They weren't even thinking about how it was that they were going to, to roll the, the stone away and gain access to, to Jesus' body. They were just doing what custom told them that they needed to do. They were going out of a sense of, of duty because Jesus had not been properly prepared when he was was put in the tomb. They didn't expect to, to find the, the empty tomb, and, and when they found that, that the tomb, was, that the stone had been rolled away, when they found that the tomb was, was empty, you know, their first thought was not, he is risen. It's not what they expected. You know, they probably were more likely to, to think, oh, who has taken the, the body of Jesus rather than then he is risen. It's easy for us to look back at that first Easter and, and, and critically think, well, why didn't they understand? Why, why didn't they, they get it? But as the women went to the tomb and, and the other followers, they, they were trying, to, they were trying to, to figure out what was going on. They were trying to, to figure out what the new normal was going to be like for them in their life. You know, there's those points in our lives where we have a significant change, a milestone moment. They happen to all of us. Sometimes it happens nationally. I remember the sixth grade class that I was in when 9-11 happened. The shift changed. Even as a sixth grader, we could tell something was different. These things happen Different generations. The moon landing for some of you. If that's you, don't raise your hand. <laughs> the end of segregation. And now we refer to things as before COVID. We have these national, generational changes. Then we have localized changes. Or life before the tornado. Or life after the tornado. Sometimes those get even smaller, like in your family. Remember when everything changed when mom died? 
Remember when everything changed when we moved? Those, those milestone moments, what they do is they mark time for us. It's less of a, on this day, my life changed. It's more of when this event took place in my life, how life looked shifted. What my life was shifted. The woman at the tomb, this is a milestone moment, but it's not one of hope yet. It's one of hopelessness. You see, they had, they had convinced themselves to believe that this, this man, Jesus, was actually the Messiah. They referred to him as, as Lord. They had put everything on this one idea. And then he died. Messiahs aren't supposed to die. That's not how it's supposed to happen. Not only did he die, he died that death. So now they've spent the last two days because they can't really do anything else except for sit on Sabbath. Why did I let myself believe? How could I be so stupid? What, what, what did he say that made me believe? And also the, the fact that their friend is now dead. So when they go there, this milestone moment is not this, I bet he's going to come back. It's, I wonder when they're coming for us. Is this now the new normal? Is this, the Romans are going to be our, our rulers forever? Is God never going to get us out of the mess that we're in? And they're alone and there are fear and there are doubts. In all that pain and hopelessness, something happens. It says, while they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them in their fright. The women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. Be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. See, the angels reminded them. How often do we know something? We've been taught it. We can recite the words. We can remember the songs. We, we got it. But in the moment that we need it, it's not there. How often do we try to remember but fail to remember what has actually happened and what he actually said? We've heard the story. God created the heavens and the earth. And as he did, he said it was good. You know, that creation was even described as paradise. But sin entered in to, through the the lives of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve who, who used the free will that God had given them, free will that did not, uh, did not do what God wanted them to do, but they rebelled. And that rebellion against God is, is called sin. And so, you know, as Adam and Eve, as humanity was separated from God because of sin, God sent his son Jesus in, into the world. And Jesus, you know, had a, a ministry here on earth. He was fully God and, and, and fully man. It was an issue that uh, as Jesus was, was put to death, there were those that thought that they had finally silenced him, but, but as they crucified Jesus on the cross and buried him in, in the tomb, he didn't stay there. It was an issue that, that uh, death did not have the, the final victory, but, but Jesus had victory over death and the grave. And, and because of that, you know, he helped to, to bridge the gap between us and, and God that had, been, had come about because of sin. You know, in our own lives, we're, we're separated from, from God because of sin. And the Bible tells us that, that the way we are reconnected with, with God is through repenting of our sins and believing in Jesus. That's the basics of, of the gospel story. That's the, the basics of, of why Jesus came, so that he could provide a way for us to repent and believe. Even though you may be familiar with, with the story, 
Even though you may be uh, aware of, of the different parts of what it is that, that God has done in, in working in, in human history, you know, there may be parts of the story that are hard for you to believe. There may be parts of the story that, that are hard for, for you to, uh, to grasp and, and to, to say, I, I understand or, or I believe. If your answer to that question is that I find it hard to, to believe or understand all the story, you're not alone. There are others throughout history who have found it hard to, to believe the story. Even going back to the disciples. The disciples who, who walked with Jesus, who, who experienced his ministry here on earth, who saw his miracles, who, who saw what, what he did in, in, in changing lives. Even the disciples found it hard to, to believe, hard to understand what had happened on that first Easter morning. It was only over time that they had a fuller, under, fuller understanding of, of what had happened and, and how God was working among them. Faith is a journey. You know, faith is a, is a journey that is actually a, a lifelong journey. You know, for me, I would say that I have been a, a Christian for, for 48 years. But my understanding and my experience of faith is not the same today as it was 48 years ago. You know, it's an issue that over time, on that, on that journey of faith for me, by reading God's Word, I've, I've learned and, and grown and gained understanding of, of, um, of who God is and how He wants to be in my life, although I still don't fully understand it. You know, it, it's been a, a journey for me, and, and through going through tough times, not necessarily tough times that I welcome or invite in my life, but, but through tough times, God has in, increased my faith on that journey. My faith has also grown as I've listened to the testimony of others and as they have shared of, about what it is that, that God has done in, in their life. You know, as we return to to the scripture story that this morning out of the, the Gospel of Luke. The women didn't understand it all. They didn't know what, what had, had really happened. They didn't understand it all, but what they did do is they returned to Jerusalem and they told others what they had experienced. They left the, the tomb and they returned to, to the place in Jerusalem where the disciples and the other believers were staying behind locked doors because they feared for their own life, wondering if they would be next on, on, on the cross. They'd seen what had happened to Jesus, and, and they were fearful. Uh, the women returned to, to Jerusalem and, and reported what, what they had experienced at the tomb. And as the women reported what they had experienced, it says that the people that to whom they told their, their story didn't believe them because their words seemed like nonsense. Even the disciples, they certainly should have understood what the, the women were, were talking about if, if anyone understood. But verse 12 says that Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Now the Gospel of John also says that, that John went with Peter to, to the tomb. When they got to the tomb, they saw that it was empty. They saw the strips of, of linen lying there. Did he believe at that point? No. It maybe started him on a, on a journey of believing, but it says that he went away wondering what had happened. You know, we give the disciples a hard time because we have the entire story in our hands, right? It's like we're, we're watching them play out their parts in a book that we have the answers to. Why didn't you believe? Bro, I can cross-reference that. In my Bible, it says that he talked about this in John 3. I don't understand. Do you not have this written down in front of you, Peter? It's right here. We can be overly critical, but they're living the story. They're going through it. So we can ask ourselves, why didn't they believe? But I think the better question is, why don't we? For many 
of them and for many of us, Jesus raised from the dead is hard to believe. Even Christians, let's be honest here. Can we be honest? Is that okay in church? Let's do it. Jesus rising from the dead is probably that one concept that keeps most of us away. You can jive with the idea that Jesus was a great teacher and had all these great ideas, but when we get to that part of the story, which is why we're all here, we're not really sure. We have doubts. Luckily, we're in good company because so did Peter, the one that Jesus said the church will be built on. He said, yeah, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I know what, I know what he said, but I got to go. I got to experience that for myself because I'm not going to allow someone else to tell me something this important and then take it at face value. And Peter ran. Not as fast as John. John makes sure to cover that too. But he got there eventually. Peter, I'm, I'm with that guy. I'm not a sprinter. He goes in because he has to see. He has to experience it for it to be real. You may be there right now. You've heard the story. You like the idea of God. And in some situations, you've prayed to him, right? The old adage that there's no atheist on a plane that's going down. Right? We can all get there when we have to. You get it, you've heard it, you have a general understanding of it, but you need to experience it. You need to experience God's love. Experience that grace before you make the jump. And we do know the whole story. Jesus is exactly who he said he was, the Messiah. He came so that we could be in relationship with God through him. Not because of how good we are, thank God, because of his perfectness and the righteousness we get from him. He brought the kingdom of God on earth, and if we confess our sins and repent of them, we're in. That's a big hurdle. Because if we have to go in through our own lives and look at places that we have sinned, that we have fallen short of God's Glory, we have to admit we're not perfect. We have to admit that we might have messed up. And that's hard. But that's what's required. And Jesus calls to all of us individually, just repent. Follow me. I'll show you how to get there. You ain't got to be perfect to come in. We'll get you there on the process. On the job training is provided. No experience required. But we have to have that experience. And yeah, life still has hardships for sure. Being a Christian is not easy. But it does mean we don't have to go through it alone that we do have hope in times of darkness, that we do have confidence in the face of fear, that we do have a God who loves us and works all things for our good. Our lives can have purpose and meaning through Jesus' purpose and meaning. And God will change you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Regardless of where you are today, know this, he is risen. Jesus has done the work already. This could be the easiest group project you were ever a part of in your entire life. All we have to do is come alongside and say, God, I love you. God, forgive me. God, help me. And he will. So today there's an invitation for you to be the child of God. You already are. It's just you don't see yourself in that way yet. Because God's grace can only go as deep as the sins we're willing to admit. And to come through the other side of that journey and say, I'm, I'm here. I don't got all the answers. I'm like Peter. I'm just trying to run to the tomb. I just want to experience it. But if you do want to experience hope, 
grace, mercy, and love. If you do want to release yourself from the shackles of sin, but also shame and guilt, good news. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You can be a part of that kingdom. What's holding you back? Let's pray. Gracious God, today on your, on your big day, we all come dressed well and with smiles on our faces and brokenness inside sometimes, God, with darkness that we try to fight through, with hopelessness that we try to put on pause today. God, we put it all at your altar. We put it all at the foot of the cross, which you have already defeated, God. We accept you as our Lord. Change us, move us, transform us, God, and make us into your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, I want to share just a little bit of a celebration with you the, this morning. Uh, yesterday, we, um, we had an Easter egg hunt, and uh, there were over 5,000 Easter eggs that were hidden on our property. And uh, you know, it took about an hour to hide everything, and within five minutes, they were all found. <laughs> We had over 165 children that participated and almost that many adults uh, as well. <laughs> so it was a great day around here and thank you for all of you who helped to, to make that, that possible. You know, during this Lenten season, we've been doing a special offering um, that goes to support camp scholarships. And so for those of you that have already given to that offering, Thank you for your generosity. Those who would still like to, to give, if you mark your offering for the Lenten offering, 
know that it will go to help support camp scholarships, and we're, we're hoping to send over 60 children and, and youth to, to camp this summer. You know, it's, uh, you know in the way of giving, there's, there's a box on, on your way out this morning. Uh, you can use the, the QR code in, in your bulletin or, or use the link that, that's online. However you choose to give, we give in, in response to, to God's love and God's goodness in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for what you entrust into our, our care. Resources, time, talents, and, and as we offer those to you, may you use them to make a difference for your kingdom here on earth. For the glory of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.